Okay, convex optimization, part four. Now, um, we, in the last video, showed that the primal problem can be written as uh, the min over x of the maximum of the Lagrangian with respect to alpha and beta. Okay, so what I'm gonna do in this video is to look at a completely different optimization problem. So this is really actually a different problem. It's not like I've rephrased the first problem. It's actually a very different problem. So when, what I'm gonna do is produce the dual problem, which switches the max and the min. Now in general, when you swap a max and a min, you don't expect the solution to be the same, but we're gonna show that actually in some very special cases, uh, it actually is the same. Okay, but for now, I want you to think of the dual as being kind of a nice tight lower bound, the, kind of the tightest lower bound on the primal. All right, so we have the dual, the, the dual problem written there, and I'm gonna uh, define the dual objective theta d as the stuff in the brackets there. So you fix alpha and beta, uh, theta d is the min over x of the Lagrangian with respect to that fix alpha and beta. Okay, so we'll call that the dual objective. Now, just some terminology here. Uh, when I put a star again, it still means optimal. So alpha, alpha star and beta star, that is the solution to the dual problem. And then d star is the optimal value of the dual objective. Uh, and then again, feasible means constraints are obeyed. So what are the constraints that we have on alpha and beta? Well, beta has no constraints, but alpha, again, um, we need to make sure that alpha is non-negative because um, again, if, if that wasn't true, the Lagrangian wouldn't be a valid lower bound for the primal objective. Okay, so I'm just going to put green boxes around them because I did that for the primal. So I feel like the dual doesn't want to be left out. So I'm putting the green boxes around them. All right, now what's next is one fact and three important lemmas. Now, the fact is that the dual objective is actually a concave function of alpha and beta. This is different than the primal objective, right? The primal objective was a convex function of x, and the dual objective is a concave function of alpha and beta. So I'll prove that in a minute. And then I'm gonna prove three, or, well, I'll, I'll prove two out of the next three lemmas. Uh, the first lemma is that if alpha and beta are dual feasible, then the dual objective is below the solution to the primal problem. So you, you should think about the primal problem, right? You solve it, no matter what, what happens, the dual, anything dual is below that, right? Dual, below, dual, anything dual is below the primal. Okay, so the dual objective provides a lower bound to the primal solution. And that leads directly to the second lemma, which is weak duality, which is for any pair of primal and dual problems, the solution of the dual is below that of the primal. So again, for the dual, you're maximizing, and for the primal, you're minimizing. And you can think about um, the maximum of the dual being less than the minimum of the, of the primal. Cool. And then the last lemma is strong duality, which is where we need to get, which says that, that the primal and dual solutions are equal to each other under some very special technical conditions called constraint qualifications. And luckily for us, in machine learning, the constraint qualifications pretty much always hold. I've never seen them not hold. So um, this is actually really neat that we can, we can swap the max and the min, and then maybe the dual can give us some way of computing things that might be a little easier. And that's gonna help us with um, support factor machines in the next set of lectures. Okay, so let me go ahead and um, try to go and prove this fact here. So, the fact is that, um, again, the dual objective is a concave function of alpha and beta. Okay, so let's fix x. We'll just, we'll just fix it for now, and, and, and I'll, get, I'll give you all the facts that you need to show this, but they're actually very, very simple. It's actually even simpler than what we did for the primal. So remember, this thing is a function of alpha and beta. Once you fix x, it's a function of alpha and beta. And so things like f of x and g of x and h of x they don't depend on alpha and beta. So they're constants as far as alpha and beta are concerned. So f of x is just a constant, right, with respect to alpha and beta. And so the, all the other terms are affine. They're all linear in alpha and beta. 
And affine functions are concave because they're concave and convex. And unsurprisingly, a minimum of a collection of concave functions is concave. And so when we take that min over x, it doesn't destroy the concavity. All right, so that's the, the proof of that. Cool. Now, onto the lemmas. So the first lemma, again, says that as long as alpha and beta are dual feasible, which again means that the alphas are non-negative, then the dual objective is less than or equal to the solution to the primal. All right, so the proof is, starts with remembering what we did to construct the Lagrangian in the first place. We lower bounded these functions that were infinite sometimes and zero other times by lines. And so we automatically, by construction, get that, that, these, that this is true. And this is true, of course, only when alpha is, is non-negative, because otherwise it wouldn't be a valid lower bound. All right, so we knew that already. And so then we can take the min over of x on both sides, and it's, it still holds, because it's true point-wise for all x. So, um, so, it's, so, so it's true as well if we put min over x on both sides. If you're uncomfortable with this, think of putting the min first on the right, OK? When you, once you put the min on the right, that fixes the value of x to be the min over all x of the primal. Take that x, and you, and you can go down to get to the Lagrangian. And then you can even go down further to get to the min over x of the Lagrangian. And so if you, that, that might make you you'll feel better to add that extra step in there. OK, great. So now we have proved the lemma. So I'm just going to take this um, expression and just move it. I'm just going to move it up a little bit just to, just to help us with the second lemma here. So I'm just putting that statement of the lemma there. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that since this is true for all alpha and beta, it's most certainly true for the alpha and beta that get you to the maximum value, right? So it's again, it's true for, for any alpha and beta. And so I can maximize over alpha and beta and still maintain that inequality. And um, here on the, on the right, all I've done is replace the primal with the maximum over alpha and beta of the Lagrangian, which we proved was equal to the primal in one of the earlier videos. OK, and so that is the second lemma. That is weak duality. For any pair of primal and dual problems, d star is less than or equal to p star. And then the, the, there is a really interesting game theoretic interpretation here. So let's think of um, us. We are the alpha and beta players, and we're trying to um, we're tr we're trying to um, maximize uh, we're we're trying to maximize the Lagrangian. Okay, so if we do that, then on the left on the left, the alpha beta player plays first, and then the x player plays second. They can respond. So whatever we play, the x player gets to respond. Whereas on the right, the x player plays first. And then the alpha beta player gets to respond. Now, you tend, you, me as the alpha beta player, I tend to do better when I can see what the other player did, right? I get to respond to it. So I'm actually gonna, I'm actually gonna have a larger value, right? Because I can see what he did before I moved. And so therefore I have the advantage. And so that's how you can think about why the um, why intuitively um, it makes sense that the um, that the that the right side is larger than the left side, right? It's because in on that side the alpha beta player can respond; they can play second. Okay. Now the very last part is that third lemma, which is that under these special constraint qualifications, d star equals p star. So if you solve the dual, you actually have in your hand the solution to the primal. Cool. Now, I will tell you the one of the constraint qualifications. There are actually many of them, but the one that really kind of does you know, all the work for us in machine learning is called Slater's condition. Now, Slater's condition is satisfied when the inequality constraints have some interior, when, when the feasible region has an interior to it, right? 
Um, so let me just read this here. So a primal dual problem pair satisfies Slater's condition if there exists some feasible primal solution X for which all inequality constraints are strictly satisfied, like not less than or equal to, but like less than, like strictly less than. So that is, there has to exist an X where all of those GI of X's are less than zero, not less, not less than or equal, to, not equal to zero. They have to be less than zero. And so the way you can think about that geometrically is that you have all of these like, like con these, um, you know, these conditions that GI has to be less than zero this way, or GI and this other GI has to be less than zero this way, and this other GI has to be less than zero this way, and um, that creates some sort of um, region there, and that region has to have an interior that is not just a point. It actually has to have a viable interior. And in machine learning, luckily for us, that's pretty much always true. Um, the only case I've ever seen where Slater's condition wasn't satisfied was a problem where you could trivially figure out the solution without ever having to look at the dual. You would just say, oh, I, you know, the constraints are satisfied at equality. I'll just use that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so the, like I said, so the only cases I've ever seen where this is not true are, are trivial cases. And so you can pretty much always safely assume, I mean, you, you probably want to just look at the constraints a little bit and just make sure but, uh, that there's an interior there. But um, in any case, you, you can just think about Slater's condition pretty much always being satisfied and that um, in that case, when you solve the dual problem, you get the solution to the primal. Okay, yeah, so in machine learning, uh, in most cases, strong duality holds. Okay, thanks.